My name is Jakub Mondowski. I work as a systems engineer for Cognified. And today I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, content validation and what, we, uh, what issues we encountered uh, over the last couple of years for, for our clients. So we've heard that before yesterday, uh, but I'd like to stress that out. Content invalidation is hard, period. There's no further discussion about that. It is not a simple topic, and it, this is not a simple problem to solve. But before we jump into invalidation, let's talk briefly about HTTP caching. I already gave a couple of talks before about that, but let's do a, a super quick recap uh, what HTTP caching is all about. So first of all, we need to define uh, what can be actually cached. So in most cases, we care about HTTP responses. An HTTP response can be either a pure body or a body plus response headers. Uh, but what really makes uh, a response cacheable. Uh, some of you will say that, OK, it has to be a GET request or response to a GET request, actually, uh, and a 200 response, probably without any dynamic data, and, and that would be the perfect use case. But that's not always the case. Uh, the, the, the second important thing about uh, HTTP responses is uh, whether the, the content itself is a dynamic or static. and I've seen multiple implementations of let's cache just the binaries and, and static files like JSs and, and CSS files. But that, it doesn't have to be this way. HTML pages are cacheable too, even though they may contain some, some dynamic bits and pieces. Uh, the body encoding is also an important bit. Uh, let's say that uh, every single response that uh, came out uh, from your dispatcher or AEM uh, is compressed via GZIP. And if that gets cached at CDN, that basically means that every single client, HTTP client from now on, has to support compression, as if there's an HTTP client that doesn't support compression, and you have a compressed copy cached at CDN, for example, you'll get a garbage back, as you, don't, you, you, you have no idea how to decompress it. There are various compressions, so you have to keep that in mind uh, when caching things. So OK, we know what, we, what can be cached. Let's uh, talk about where we can do it. And there are multiple levels. We can uh, cache stuff at AEM directly. Uh, you can have a custom in-memory cache for things to speed up uh, page rendering or speed up delivery in general. Uh, of course, dispatcher is the second thing. Uh, we, we, we used to have CDN, so most of you probably have a CDN um, in front of your AEM app. Uh, and finally, the web browser. This is a, often an, an overlooked item, the web browser specifically. But it is very, very important uh, from a user perspective, um, especially when we consider the, the page, the, the experience that the user uh, have on your website. All right, so invalidation strategies. There are two generic models. You can either, you can either use a TTL-driven approach, which basically says, OK, let's cache it for like 10 minutes, and you, you won't see any updates uh, as long as the, the TTL is still valid, so you have to wait for that to expire. Or you can use an event-driven approach where when um, every single activation or every single um, action uh, that happens on your content is reflected in, uh, in your caches, or either a single cache or a, uh, or a multi-layer cache. Uh, but in practice, is it, it does very often a, a mix of both approaches, as there are use cases for the first and there are, there are use cases for the second approach as well. Uh, speaking of dispatcher itself, there are three primary techniques. Most of you know them very well. So you can use stat files, which are built in. Which that, that's a built-in functionality. And uh, yeah, that, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's not ideal, but it's there. And you can use it to, to invalidate things. Uh, you can use TTLs, of course. And you can narrow down the scope of invalidation to a single resource only. And there's a few extras that you can use. Uh, the first is refetching. That's, that's a really handy feature. But um, the problem with re th there's a couple of problems with re refetching. I'm not going to talk about that uh, here, but uh, it's there. And, and most of the time, that can be used to keep assets pre-populated in your dispatcher cache. 
And the most important bit uh, when it comes to dispatcher and validation is that you can extend it. And you can extend it through a custom script that, that can be specified in, the, um, in your configuration. So here's a snippet. Uh, again, that, that's super straightforward. You have a document root, you have a bunch of cache rules, and at the bottom there's a script that can be really, really useful. Uh, so here's an invalidation request. Again, sort of a standard uh, when it comes to AEM. Um, it contains a few elements, a few crucial elements, and those elements are specified by these three headers. So the action, what actually has happened, whether you activate it or deactivate it thing, what was activated or deactivated, and what was the scope of the activation. And those three headers will be passed on to, this, to your script. And some of you may say, okay, that's nothing fancy. We already heard that. We know how, to, how does it work. But uh, it actually gives you plenty of options. So first of all, you can handle related resources. So let's say that your page depends on a couple of other things or, or the other way around. There are references on your page in, in other pages and you have to handle those relations somehow, and that script is a perfect place to, to do that. Of course, you can use stat files, but it won't be super accurate, and you have to do it, most of the time, you have to do it in a, a little bit more accurate uh, way. Uh, second thing is, you can send additional calls further, uh, further downstream. So if you have a cache in front of a dispatcher, which is a CDN, that's a perfect place to send a call directly to uh, CDN's API. Uh, if you have uh, some fancy monitoring system, you can send events from the invalidation script uh, to your monitoring API to correlate events uh, further down the line. All right, so CDN invalidation. Uh, the plan uh, was super simple. Uh, there's a couple of bullet points here, but the bottom line is let's use the CDN efficiently and let's be as precise as possible when invalidating things. Uh, before we move on, we have to realize that the way Dispatcher and CDN see the content structure is different. So for most of the implementations, Dispatcher typically mirrors the, the same content structure that you have in AEM. It doesn't have to be this way, but the most practical use case is let's keep it similar. It will be much, much easier to invalidate things. Uh, the way CDN sees your cache is a bit different. Most likely, you don't have those long content whatever URLs. You have short URLs, probably without an extension or without trailing slashes. Maybe the, the, the whole structure is a, bit, a little bit misaligned. Uh, but the, the way the cache looks from a dispatcher and CDN perspective is just different. So let's, let's have a look here. We have a fairly, fairly simple structure. And if you'd like to map that to URLs, it can be like this. So let's say the home node is mapped to your home page, the root of the, root of the page. Uh, the About Us page uh, is, is straightforward again. We just need to uh, remove a, a, a bunch of bits and pieces from the path, and we get the, the customer-facing URL. Uh, but what if, what if we have a, a node placed in a, in a structure rather deep? Uh, but there's a bit, there's an element here, that, the x, y, z, that, that's not present anywhere in the structure. Uh, and we can make it even more complex. Let's say that we have a category to HTML. It's placed like right here, but the, the customer facing URL is like this. There's no summer sale anywhere in the path, but it can be like this. Um, all right, so this is how the dispatcher cache looks like. This is the CDN view. CDN like the storage uh, under the hood is typically a huge key value structure. So you have a bunch of keys, and you have a, each key is, a, is an identifier, and the, the value is basically the response uh, for your object. Uh, those keys are calculated using a hash function, and that hash function, you can think of it like an MD5 out of something. And that something is typically what came in with the request, which is a protocol, uh, HTTP method, um, some headers, a path maybe. They need, in, some, in some CDNs, you can actually amend that, so that's not hard-coded, uh, which, which can be really, really useful. All right, so here's an overview of what we are actually trying to achieve. Uh, so let's say someone activated an asset or a page on, on authoring that got replicated to publish. Publish will send an event to dispatcher. Uh, dispatcher will receive that, and then the script will be triggered. And if it has all the information, let's say, uh, 
I can calculate the short path, like the customer facing one, just from the path. I can just send the call directly to the CDN API and that's it. But very often that's not enough. For example, that summer sale example, you have to ask for additional information uh, to, to calculate the, the customer facing URL and then send the invalidation accordingly. Uh, unfortunately, you can't uh, modify the, those three parameters. That's hard coded. You have no uh, configure, there's no configuration around that whatsoever. So you have to rely on that, uh, whatever comes in and whatever is built in. Uh, speaking of CDN APIs, uh, very, very often there's more than just one API. So, for example, in Akamai, there's like five different APIs, uh, and there are, there are differences between them. Uh, so, for example, the way you authenticate is different. Like, sometimes you need a username and password. Uh, sometimes you need a, a, a token. Sometimes you need some, I don't know, a timestamp plus a token. So, there are differences uh, in a way you interact with those APIs. Uh, and performance of them is also, uh, like, they, they may vary. So basically, uh, the older the API is, the slower, the slower it will be. So let's say they're, they're version two of um, Akamai invalidation API, which needs like five minutes to invalidate content, uh, but the new version needs like 10 seconds or so. So you, your mileage may vary. Uh, the scope of the invalidation uh, is also a subject you uh, have um, impact on. So you can invalidate everything. By everything, I mean every single object that got cached for a particular domain, let's say. Uh, so that can be either all HTMLs, all the client libs, all the HTMLs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can invalidate a single URL or a, or a set of URLs. Uh, or you can invalidate things by a group or by a tag, by a label, whatever you call it, but you have a more selective approach as well. It's not available everywhere, but uh, some CDNs offer that. All right, so let's uh, do a practical example here. Uh, let's say we'd like to invalidate them assets. Uh, that sounds trivial, right? This is a, a binary after all. So, okay. Right. You invalidated the binary, and, and what ne what's next? Well, it turns out you have to think about renditions. Like, every single asset has a set of renditions. So you have to keep that in mind that that's not only a single binary, this is a set of binaries. Uh, you can assign alternative texts if, for some reason, you can't uh, display, uh, display that binary. You can display the alternative text. Uh, what if you have an extra property that's used uh, during rendering to display the asset? You have to keep Keep those things in mind. So let's say we'd like to invalidate all the, rend all the renditions. Since this is a Slink conference after all, let's use a, a handy Slink uh, feature. So you can go to renditions.one.json to get all the renditions. And those are here. So you have all the dimensions that you need, and you can build out all the URLs that have to be invalidated. There is also an original rendition, but there's no dimensions there, so let's move on. Uh, but there's another node called metadata.json that you can use to get a width and length of an image. So having that in mind, you can send an invalidation to, to the CDN API. Uh, there's quite a few things here, but the most important bit is at the bottom. So we basically compare, OK, if the path I've just invalidated is a DAM asset, then get all the renditions, build the payload that API expects, and just send the, API, send the request to the API. So here's an example of uh, Akamai API call. Uh, this is a fairly simple post. Uh, it requires some really complex invalidation, but thankfully there are API clients that does the, all the heavy lifting for you. Uh, and that, that's the payload that you need to send. So even though you activated a single object, you have to invalidate a bunch of them in, in the CDN. Uh, at some point in time, we got a, a ticket from, from the content team that, hey, I've just, invalid, I, I've just updated the alt text on, the, uh, on, on some asset. I activated the asset, but I can't see the new alt text. And well, that's kind of expected, as the alt text, is not, alt text is not a part of the object itself. It is rendered in the HTML markup. So it's not enough to activate just the asset. You have to activate all the pages that give an asset was uh, that, 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 that has a reference to, to that asset. All right, so how can we do that? 
first of all, we need to get all the pages that, has a, that have a reference to, to our page. And there's a handy feature in AEM itself. Uh, it's a built-in feature, so that uh, there's a query builder API that you can use to extract additional information. Uh, so here's an input. We just, we'd like to get all the, all the nodes, in general, from the repository under content adapt to uh, with a file reference property uh, with a, that value set. Uh, the output of that will be like this. It's not ideal. There's a few shortcomings in the Query Builder API. So let's say if you'd like to get, like, give me all the siblings of my node or give me all the children with this particular type, that's not possible. You have to process it further uh, to get all the details you need. But I would say it's good enough. It's not ideal, but it's good enough. And you have all the references available in a JSON form, which can be easily processed. All right, so what about vanity URLs? Um, on every single page, you can uh, configure a bunch of additional, like, easy to remember and user-friendly uh, paths. Let's say that you have a product that has a normally a very long path. Let's say that would be like forward slash product, forward slash category, forward slash subcategory, forward slash the product, and that's quite long. So you'd like to short it to like forward slash product X. And that can be configured as a vanity URL. Uh, typically, those vanity URLs will be redirects, but uh, it doesn't mean that we can't cache it. We, of course, we can cache them. Uh, and those pages, as I said, we can cache them at, at, at CDN. So CDN can respect redirects. So whenever you go to forward slash product X, you will be redirected to that long path. All right, so let's say we have three different vanity URLs like this. Uh, and it turns out there is a handy feature in the Flash agent. I didn't know that for like quite a long time. Uh, I don't know where that, uh, when that appeared, but uh, there is an alias update option, and when you enable that, you'll get this. So in your um, in validation log, you will see that first, whenever you activate the page itself, you'll see that all the vanities are invalidated first, then the actual page gets invalidated. So you don't have to really bother about like, sending a yet another query builder call to get all the vanities. That's a built-in functionality. All right, so another thing is about reusable components. So let's say you have a page, and on every single page you have a, you have a header, you have a footer, maybe you have a, I don't know, like a component that provides search, et cetera, et cetera. So there are things that are reusable across pages. And whenever you make a change on a page uh, in, in a shared component like this, uh, that basically means you have to invalidate all the pages, which is not convenient whatsoever. Like if you, let's say you have like 10,000 pages and you updated the header, that basically means you have to get rid, get rid of all those pages both from dispatcher cache and from CDN cache. That, that's not an ideal situation. Especially if you, have, if you have a heavy trafficked website, getting rid of, of the entire cache is, is a bad idea. And for, thankfully, there is a solution to that, which is quite, uh, quite easy. And it's called a Sling Dynamic Include. If you haven't heard about that, you should definitely Google that. Uh, it's a part of, the, part of the Sling these days. And you can use it to actually um, extract those common elements or non-cacheable elements, as that's a typical use case for, use case for SDI on a page. Uh, there are two markups uh, or two forms, I would say, uh, that SDI supports that either uh, server-side include or edge-side include. The difference between them is that the first one, the, the SSI, uh, is evaluated at uh, Apache level. The edge side include is typically evaluated by, by a CDN. All right, so let's say we have a page like this. Uh, fairly straightforward, header, footer, a bunch of components, and that's it. But, and as I said, whenever we, if, if we have like 10,000 uh, of them and there's a change in the footer, everything needs to be invalidated. But what if, what if we replace the, the div or whatever the tag is in the HTML markup with something like this? 
That basically means that whenever the response comes from uh, firmware AEM, it will contain just the two placeholders, the placeholder for the, for the footer and the header, and the body itself. Like, there will be no header and footer if you ask uh, for the content directly uh, on AEM. But if there is a CDN in front, it can evaluate those. And because of that, you can get a header and a footer on every single page. And the, the invalidation, the scope of the invalidation will be super small. As if you invalidate the footer, there will be just a single call to the CDN to invalidate the footer. The C Sorry, the CDN will assemble the page for you, so you don't have to bother about cross-page invalidations anymore. All right, but it turns out that not everything can be um, wrapped into includes. Like if you have, uh, let's say, a layout or a template, if you've moved like from a single column layout or like three column layout, this is not something that you can wrap into uh, either SSI or ESI. Uh, what if you have a config that actually impacts the way the markup gets rendered? Let's say you, I don't know, add a parameter or change the parameter that, that's, an, I don't know, an endpoint to, for your, like, I don't know, site crawler or something, and that's present on every single page. Uh, so again, it has to be, it, it basically means that you have to invalidate all the pages, all the pages anyway. So, well, do we have to use Query Builder to get all the references? Not necessarily. So let's say we have uh, something like this. Uh, we have uh, 99 articles. And every single article uses uh, an article template, and that article template is referenced, uh, actually uses the article layout. And someone decided, OK, we need to refresh all the articles. Let's move on from a single column layout to like two column layout. So yeah, what we can do, what we can do here? Typically, we would have to invalidate, like specify what pages actually use that layout or that template and invalidate them explicitly. Uh, but there's, a, there's another way we can use. So um, let's say we have a situation like this. The web browser or the HTTP client in general sends a request to a CDN. The CDN's cache is empty. Uh, so we have to send the request back to the origin. In our case, the dispatcher is the origin. Uh, dispatcher has, a, has that object in cache. Uh, so we serve the cached response uh, back to the CDN. But alongside the response, we send additional header. Not sure if you can see that, but there are three headers here. The most important one is the uh, surrogate key header. And it has a value, uh, article value. Uh, so we can apply, let's say, if the path matches to some regex, then apply that particular uh, response header to the response. Uh, next, someone activates the, the article layout. So it gets replicated to a publisher. Uh, and publish will send an invalidation call to, to, the, to uh, dispatcher, and dispatcher can call um, the, uh, the CDN uh, with required information. So instead of uh, asking publish, okay, give me all the pages here, uh, I mean, I get the, the invalidation, give me all the pages that uh, use particular layout, and then invalidate all of them at once or in batches, you can. Uh, attach additional logic here. So if this is an article layout, let's invalidate all the articles. And all the articles will be referenced by that, by that tag here. So here's how it looks in practice. So instead of like building a payload with all those paths, you can send a call uh, to a different API. Actually, this is an example from, from a different CDN from Fastly, uh, with a tag article, and all of a sudden, the, they, they will all, all the heavy lifting for you, so you don't have to bother about that, how many pages got cached or how many articles do you have. The only thing you care about is, I want to invalidate all the articles, as I know that article layout got activated, which is re and that, that's really, really handy. All right, so we talked a little bit about CDN and a few use cases. There were more, but I have just 30 minutes, so I have to skip the, some of them. Uh, Browser caching, that's very often an overlooked item. Like, people don't really care about that as long as there's no issues, I mean, caching issues in the browser. But it turns out that the caching itself is quite complex. There's no, like, a single cache in the browser. There's a couple of caches in the browser. Uh, so here's an example how the 
typical cache layout looks like these days in the browser. And that, that's not easy. This is not like a control or command F5 and, and we're done. It is a bit more complex. All right, so how we can, how we can solve caching issues or what issues we can actually uh, face uh, in the browser. So first of all, uh, client libs. Whenever you make a change in your JavaScript file, you'd like to make that change visible nearly immediately. Uh, and if, if the path doesn't change, that basically means you have to invalidate all the JSs explicitly. So someone came up with an idea, let's use version client libs, which is, which is good. And the version can be either a number or, a, I don't know, like MD5 out of, out of the script content, and it will become a part of the URL. And, and that's great. You don't have to bother about caching in the browser. You can cache those client libs forever, as whenever there is a change, the URL will change. So yeah, problem solved. Um, actually, is it really solved? So whenever you change the, the URL, that basically means that every single HTML file that has a reference to, to that JS file or a CSS file would have to be updated. So a single JavaScript file change basically means get rid of all the HTMLs. Uh, and we are back in the, in the starting point. All right, thankfully, someone thought about that. And uh, using a clever uh, cache control uh, parameters, you can actually get what you want. So cache control uh, is probably it's supposed to be the standard these days. There are other headers like expires or pragma or whatever, but the, the, the cache control is the one you should focus on these days. Uh, so first of all, you can define the scope uh, of a response, so whether that's uh, public or private. But public basically means that any in-between cache can actually put it in memory and serve it from there, so, so things like CDN. The private basically means that the response is just for you, uh, and any cache in-between should prevent uh, sh should stop caching such asset. Uh, you can also specify for how long a given asset should be cached. Uh, you can use extra option like must revalidate. Must revalidate basically means that whenever the TTL expire, please do not serve stale content. Uh, and, and that basically means that it has to be revalidated. And there is a one header, a one, uh, one option that's very often misunderstood. Uh, no cache, uh, the funny thing about no cache is it doesn't mean no cache. Uh, the no cache says you can cache your asset, but please make sure you have the latest copy. So let's say um, I have a J JavaScript file that got cached for like seven days in the browser, and whenever I'm trying to use that, please send a request to uh, your origin or to the CDN to make sure I have the latest copy. And the flow is like this. Uh, it, this is a, an example for HTML, but it doesn't really change much. So let's say someone requested contact us HTML. Uh, CDN cache was empty. We need to refetch it from the dispatcher. Uh, so we send the request back. We get a response. That response contains uh, last modified and e tag headers. And that's really crucial. So CDN thinks, OK, that's cacheable. Let me put it in cache and it will send the response back. When someone uh, mm, refreshes the page, uh, the browser will send a, a, a request again, but this time it will be different. It will be a conditional get, not the regular get. The difference between a regular get and conditional get is that you have uh, some extra headers uh, that says, give me the latest copy if it doesn't match the checksum, or give me the latest copy if the, the one you have is newer than the date I'm aware of. Uh, so if the object is the same, the CDN or the Apache or whatever you use will reply, nothing has changed. Please use whatever you've, you cached so far. So there's no transfer whatsoever. You get just the headers back and, OK, nothing has changed. Please keep going as you used to. All right, since we have just a minute left uh, and we are running out of time, so the truth is we've just scratched the surface. There's a lot of issues I haven't talked about. So things like API throttling. So you can't send infinite amount of requests to the API. Uh, what if the API replied with non-200, or you get a, something in the response body that you're supposed to be 
like aware of, like, okay, maybe your password will expire in like five days. Uh, let's say we have a um, reference to like 10,000 pages. If you put 10,000 pages in the post payload, most likely you will get a message back that, okay, that payload is, is too large. You have to split it in, in, in a couple of batches. Uh, what if there are non-obvious content references that you can't really detect with uh, Query Builder or those slink calls? Uh, there's a lot of other issues that we haven't talked about. But we learned a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, purge all is really, really dangerous. Unfortunately, we learned that the hard way. So we did that. It wasn't intentional, uh, but it was actually, that was the, the JS file update. So we updated JS and we had to update all the old HTMLs and it, it ended badly. Uh, so this is a really terrible idea. If someone says that you can invalidate all the entire cache all at once, please do not do that unless you have like two requests per second, and you don't really bother about that. But if you have a website that's visited by people all the time from all over the world, please don't do, it. do this. Um, second thing is, um, we used stat file uh, for quite a long time, but that's not precise enough. Uh, and if you really, really need a precise invalidation course, and, and most likely you do, uh, please, spend some time on that and make sure uh, whenever you update something, all the related resources will be uh, invalidated as well. Uh, additionally, if you're aware that there are shared components or shared elements between pages, please think about SDI and, and those includes direct directives. Uh, it doesn't have to be implemented this way, but you have to find a way how to tackle that in the future at, at some point in time. That issue will appear, trust me. Um, and finally, uh, if you do a lot of query builder calls uh, and you ask for non-standard properties or even a standard ones, but they, if they don't have uh, any built-in index, please make sure you add it one in your application, as it will take ages to process like 20,000 pages uh, looking for a, like, a reference to some non-standard property. And yeah, that would be it. Thank you. All right, do we have any questions? There's one over there. Yep. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, I, got, I got just one uh, practical question. What scripting language do you recommend for the, the dispatcher part? The so it really depends how complex your application is. If you have a fairly simple app, Bash will do the work. But we, like a couple months ago, we realized there's too much logic there, and it's not really practical to maintain that anymore. And we are actually thinking about rewriting that in something more high level, like Python or Ruby or whatever. It doesn't have to be a shell script. It can be anything that, that gets triggered. So it really depends on the complexity. Probably the, the bash scripting and a couple of ifs is the, the easiest way to start with. But as you move on, you probably need to consider more feature-rich language. Thank you.